uh, is the tutorial session, um, tutorial and the practice session. Uh, today that we have uh, Dr. Manuel Laguna. Uh, he's the medium one professor of management science and the faculty director of global in initiative at the Lee School of Business of University of Colorado Boulder. He has done extensive extensive research in the interface between computer science, artificial intelligence, and operations research, resulting in over 100 publications, including four books. He has received research funding from private industry and the government agencies such as NSF, uh, Office of Naval Research, and uh, uh, EPA. He is the co-founder of a company called uh, Optex Systems, and uh, it's a software and a consulting company provide optimization solutions. And he's also the editor in chief of the Journal of Heuristics and has been the division chair and the senior associate dean and the intern dean at the Lee School of Business. Uh, with that, I will give the floor to Dr. Aguan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thanks for coming. I know there are many choices in these big conferences, so um, it's a little intimidating. I see the room, uh, at least a couple of people who could be giving this talk as, as opposed to me, so uh, I'll try to uh, do my best. So um, as you know, these, uh, these tutorial sessions are part of this uh, series of tutorials, and uh, so there is an actual written tutorial. Uh, document that you can uh, access, I think, online. I think they used to be printed, but now they are only online. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is that uh, this, this talk is going to follow very closely what, uh, what was written that, uh, in that tutorial, including uh, most of the examples that I'm going to be showing. All right, so we have, uh, um, we have a long session here, so we uh, might as well get started here. Um, so we're going to talk about taboo search and scattered search. I uh, spent many of my uh, academic years uh, working on these topics, and, uh, and, and I hope uh, you find this interesting, uh, what I'm going to share here with you. So let's start just uh, framing um, this idea of why, why, you use, why we want to use scatter search, why we want to use table search, and this idea of optimal solutions versus heuristic solutions. So um, uh, one in, uh, of the interesting thing about our, our field, uh, at least the field of optimization, and in particular combinatorial optimization, is that sometimes you have some e really easy problems, and uh, small changes to these easy problems uh, make them really hard. Uh, and the, the change could seem trivial, and, uh, and, and, uh, but then uh, to, <laughs> to find a solution is, is, is far from trivial. And, um, so the example here is this. Uh, so imagine you have that, uh, that graph, right? And, uh, and, and you're trying to minimize, um, say that it's a telecommunications uh, network that, uh, where you have potential links where you're going to put cable. And, uh, and, and you want to connect all these nodes, and you want to minimize the amount of cable to use. Well, this, as you know, if you want to connect everything, uh, uh, as you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a simple problem. It's actually uh, you can find an optimal solution very simply by uh, what we know as the minimum spanning tree, right? So very simple thing. Uh, you can be greedy. You can start. In fact, you can start. Up, up, you know, normally you start here, right? You say this is the one that is the cheapest link, and then you start uh, adding links uh, in a greedy fashion until you are done uh, connecting the whole thing. So uh, we all know this is a textbook kind of problem. But let's just make a very si what seems to be a very simplistic change, which is all right. Instead of connecting all the nodes, that we just want to connect five of them. All right, in this in this network, and find which one will be uh, which five will be the uh, they have the ones that have the uh, minimum weight, uh, the sum of the weights. Well, that makes the problem <laughs> into a really difficult problem. Uh, and in fact, if you if you use a heuristic, the same heuristic we were using earlier, starting here and and just uh, uh, adding uh, 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 links uh, the in the cheapest possible way, you end up with this solution on the on the left hand side, this A. Uh, but it turns out that that one is not, is, is, is well, uh, given that it's an example, obviously strict, so you will, uh, you will find a solution that is actually totally different from the optimal solution. The optimal solution is this one. That's if you want to find five uh, nodes to 
uh, connect uh, in the uh, least cost uh, way. So that's where uh, an optimal procedure turns into a heuristic procedure that may not be actually all that good. And, um, and that's where meta heuristics uh, come in, right? So the meta heuristic idea is to be able to, uh, even if you use a heuristic, to be able to move from that solution to uh, hopefully a near optimal solution or optimal using meta heuristic strategies. So uh, that's all just to introduce this idea that heuristics uh, are, uh, uh, meta heuristics are strategies that are uh, uh, superimposed on, uh, on heuristics to make, them, uh, to, to, to make them better. But there is a trade off for sure, right? And we're gonna be throughout the session talking about this trade off and the trade off is complexity, all right? And complexity typically um, uh, shows in two different ways. One is the design of the, of the implementation, and the other piece is the parameters that need to be adjusted on, this, on these procedures. And uh, so uh, we'll talk about the strategies, we'll talk about designs, and then, but always be thinking about, okay, so uh, how is this making it more complex? And uh, I'll bring up, bring up a few of those things and, uh, and you probably can think of others. All right, so in particular, what we're going to do today is talk about two main meta heuristic uh, methodologies. So one is uh, table search, the other one is scatter search. But there in the middle is something that is called path relinking. And uh, path relinking is a strategy that was conceived within table search, it's been used with both scatter search and table search, this path relinking, but actually even outside that framework. So it's being used almost uh, as a heuristic on its own right. Um, and uh, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about it uh, in, um, in that context as well. All right, so let's start with table search. Now, uh, if you have uh, read or have the curiosity to look at some of the table search work, the most common thing you're gonna find is what's in the first line there, short-term memory, right? So table search is a, is, a, is a methodology that uses memory much in the same way that a human will use memory, right? You, you remember certain things and, it, and, then, and then you forget some, some things. I've, nowadays I forget more things than I remember, but, uh, uh, but in, the, in, this, uh, in this context, the idea is you remember certain things, you keep them for a while in memory, and then you, and then you let them go, all right? So that part here, the top, part is what in you normally see as an implementation of table search, but uh, I will try to convince you that if you want to use it for your research or actually for uh, um, in terms of practice, because I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the introduction that was mentioned that we, uh, we have a company where we have used a lot of this uh, in practice and uh, that probably not, uh, while you can get very reasonable methods and implementations that work fairly well just with that element, uh, I will argue that, uh, that, that it will be uh, very um, powerful to try to implement some of the, of the other elements of, uh, of table search, which are, they seem complex, but actually you, you will see today, hopefully, that uh, they are not that more um, complicated to, to incorporate in the, in the implementation. So we'll go through those, uh, through those four elements and uh, in, in, in that order. All right, so we're gonna be talking about, a minimi in general, just so, so we're all in the same page, it's gonna be a minimization problem with subject to some, um, uh, to some constraints and, uh, and that's what frames the next few slides. Also a few definitions here. So uh, searches, you know, typically for taboo search is a neighborhood based search so what uh, we're doing here is moving from one solution to another based on moves. And a move is, uh, is an operation that transforms a solution from one to another and it creates a neighborhood that gets to be explored and where the direction of the, at least in this version to start with, the direction of the, um, uh, of the search is given by a move value, all right? So if we're minimizing a move value that is negative, is, uh, is improving, move values of zero or positive are not improving moves, all right? So that's where we are. Okay, so let's take a look at, at this. So this is a simple, greedy, heuristic, steepest descent, right? Everybody probably is familiar with this. You start with an, an initial solution, 
the idea here is to find the best uh, neighbor in this neighborhood. So X star is the best neighbor neighborhood. And if that best neighborhood, or th th that best neighbor um, has a, a value, a move value that is negative, then we move to that neighbor and then we keep doing this until we find a local optimum. So this is the typical just neighborhood search, local search, find uh, that results in uh, local optimum. Okay. Now, in many of these problems, the problem with something like this is that this neighborhood could be very, very large, right? So in combinatorial optimization, that's not uh, atypical that you're going to have neighborhoods that are very, very large. So they say, well, how can we, uh, how can we do this uh, in a, a little bit better and still uh, be aggressive in terms of finding better solutions? Well, uh, one possibility, which is, and here, um, I mentioned it as one possibility because the, the larger strategy here is something that is called candidate lists. You create a candidate list of moves that you're going to examine. Now here is a one version of that. The candidate list here is really um, a uh, list of moves until you find the first one that improves. Now uh, also it could very well happen that you don't find anything that improves and then you stop. But um, here, talking about uh, design issues, look, if you start searching this neighborhood and you break, you stop the first time you find a, an improving move, then the order in which this is going to be searched matters, right? In the previous slide, the order didn't matter because we're going we're gonna to search them all, right? We're going to examine all of them until we find the best move. Here, we're not doing that. Here we're going to stop. Uh, so even though this is a simplified just pseudocode, you had to uh, see he, that the order matters. All right. So that um, uh, one way of doing this is creating a circular list in that in the first iteration, you know, you say you have some le lexicographical order in which you go. When you find the first improving move, you make the move. And in the next iteration, you actually pick up where you left, as opposed to starting again from the top of the list. All right, so there are things like that. So, but all just does goes to mention that uh, there are design. This is as simple as it looks like. There are already design issues that you have to deal with. Okay. All right. So in this in this case, we look for the for the first improving, and we make the move if it's improving, and if not, we don't make it. Okay. So. Again, it gets stuck in a, some local, local optimal point. And this is where taboo search comes, right? So this is the, our first little taboo search design that uses short-term memory. Not, I'm not saying exactly how. It's just a, there, there is a, it's just a line that says update short-term memory. We're not saying exactly how. But see the complication here, right? We, we have a simple a heuristic there, and now we have to put all this other stuff in there. All right, so what are we doing here? Well, we need to keep track of two different things. One is the best solution that we're finding as we're uh, searching the neighborhood. And the other one is the best solution that we ever seen while running the entire procedure, okay? So uh, that one is uh, denoted as X best, and the other one is, um, uh, is this uh, X star, right? So now we go through here, and the one thing to actually point out, uh, which is very different from the previous one, looks like insignificant change, but it's pretty significant is this star right there. So the, the moves or the neighbors that we're going to examine is on a reduced neighborhood. That reduced neighborhood is what makes double search what it is. And how you reduce the neighborhood is what we're, you know, is, is what we're talking about. But it's, we're going to talk about, but that, that's what makes double search work, right? We are, um, uh, we got, there are strategies and rules to reduce this neighborhood so it's not the entire one. Um, and that has to do with what's been uh, activated as a taboo, um, as a taboo move, um, in, and therefore that creates some, in, if you will, taboo solutions, al although we never talk about taboo solutions, we talk about taboo moves that will reduce the neighborhood of solutions that can be reached from a particular solution where you're sitting at right now. So. You can see here there is a search for the best for the uh, first improving. 
If you don't find it, if you find it, that's fine. If you can improve the best that you ever seen, you do it. But regardless of whether this is, uh, turns into a um, move that is going to be improving or not, the move is made. You see, that's the big difference from the, from the previous one. The move is always made, and then the update of the, of the uh, memory, uh, the short-term memory, happens to then modify the neighborhood in the next iteration. All right. All right. So the criteria here typically had have to do with uh, number of iterations or time spent uh, running the procedure, that type of thing. So at some point, you say we have enough and we uh, we move on. All right. So how is that the reduced neighborhood uh, operates? Well, operates in the following way. Um, you have rules that classify certain moves taboo, and if it's taboo, you are not going to go to that neighbor. And, uh, and, and so in that way, you can see that taboo search is, um, a, is, is a neighborhood method, but it's dynamic because the, the neighborhood keeps changing as you move along in the search, okay? Now, how are you gonna implement the uh, memory? That's the big question, isn't it? <laughs> okay, memory, how, does, how is that gonna work? Well, one simple thought could be to think about explicit memory. Right, and you say, all right. Um, in uh, in explicit memory, is you use basically try to use some sort of a structure that will tell you whether you've been in that solution or not. Because the idea will be to say, well, if I already visited a solution, I don't want to see it again. Why would I go there again? Um, we're gonna answer that question in a minute, but I can tell you that there are. Um, this, this is, in general, they speaking, is a bad idea, right? It takes it's too much memory, it's just not, uh, and it also takes a lot of time to be able to check that whether you, you've been there or not. But there are contexts where, where this makes sense, and uh, this goes back to this idea that, were, that we were, um, that, uh, in the introduction, that we had this uh, company, Optech, where most of the work for many years was in optimization of simulations. And in that world, Explicit memory is actually not terrible. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a possibility. And in fact, sometimes it's even a necessity. And the reason being is that imagine that you have a simulation that evaluates the objective function and that it takes a tremendous amount of computer effort to, uh, to run. Um, well, you certainly are not going to ever try to run the same solution twice there. And uh, explicit memory is used there. Now, but think about this, we're only talking about maybe um, fewer than 10,000 iterations, okay? So 10,000 calls to, do that, to that simulator. Now you have to pick them like very carefully. Now obviously these problems have very reduced uh, 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 set of variables. But there is, a, there is room for something like this, but that's not the typical implementation that you're going to see. The typical one is more like this. It's a recency-based uh, attributed memory. Now, what this means um, is that out of a solution, you find an attribute. Now, an attribute could be uh, the index of a variable or some kind of identifier of an edge on a graph or the index of a job or anything that identifies very, a, a very core element of a solution, all right? And that is going to be declared um, taboo active. We're gonna see some examples. So taboo active elements and plus the rules, so there are taboo uh, classification rules, is what gives you where you can move and, um, or not, all right? So that's going to declare some moves taboo uh, by the combination of the attribute that, is, that the move is uh, either adding or deleting or changing and the status of that one particular attribute, all right? So that's kind of how it works. We'll, um, We'll see a couple of examples in a minute. So, um, so taboo moves that are um, uh, that are the ones that prevent um, the search from going to certain neighbors, all right? And that therefore creates this n star neighborhood, which is the reduced neighborhood of what can be visited or not. All right? Okay, so. Let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of, uh, of examples. You know, I mentioned, I think at least one of them, I mentioned the first one. The index of, of a variable, 
uh, the change values, uh, that, is, uh, that is a very typical uh, attribute on, uh, on, this, uh, on these searches. Uh, or the index of an element, an element here, as I said, it could be a job, it could be an edge on a graph. All right, so you can see, start seeing the, the, <laughs> the design uh, uh, choices here, right? So which attribute are we gonna use? Uh, and how is that we're going to activate that attribute? So these are all design choices that the, uh, I guess the good news of Taboo Search is that it has all this flexibility, and that's also the bad news, <laughs> because uh, you have so many choices that you, have, you, can, you can consider, but some, some, um, some probably are more um, uh, immediate and, and, and relevant, and those are the things to try first. Okay, so, and then it comes the parameters, right? So, and say, well, for how long are we going to remember that we did this? Now, we say it's not going to be explicit, it's not going to be forever. So, we have to just remember for a, for a number of iterations, and that's the so called taboo tenure. Taboo tenure is a simple um, concept, it's just how long so, uh, an element is going to stay uh, be, uh, taboo active. But, um, but it also has a number of choices of how this could be implemented. Uh, the normal, very simplistic way of doing this will be you have a fixed number of iterations that uh, applies to all the elements that become taboo active, and that's the simplest way of doing this. Uh, it could be dynamic, it changes during the search. You know, there is a, a concept called reactive taboo search where you know, they react to changes in the search and they make it smaller, larger, these, these taboo tenures. Um, uh, they, could, um, they could also be asymmetric. So for example, if you have um, a, um, a problem on a graph where you take one edge, remove one edge, or the, the, the moves are removing an edge or, or adding an edge, it could be that when you remove it, that edge becomes tab taboo active for a number of iterations that is different from what when you add a, an edge. So it could be asymmetric as well. So again, just it's very hard to go through all the <laughs> variants of the things that could be done, but I'm just giving you a taste of the um, design choices that need to be made when, when this is implemented. Okay, so, and then finally, the last element that must be there for any uh, taboo search is this idea of aspiration criteria. And the, the typical one is the one that's there, which is, hey, if, you, if something is taboo, that's fine. But if, if making that move is gonna take you to a solution that, you, that is better than anything you ever encountered during the search, well, it, it would not be very wise not to make the move, right? So you can override uh, taboo status uh, in, in, under certain circumstances, and this one is, is probably the most clear of, of all of them. See how we're doing here. Okay. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's take a look at um, at some examples. So um, this is uh, the very well known knapsack problem. And um, by the way, uh, what I'm putting here, and I think we um, we, we shared that uh, online, is that I have some uh, series of spreadsheets where um, I have used it as an illustration. Here is hard because you know it's. it's it's meant to be more interactive, but if you want to have uh, any of that, either for teaching others or, or, or um, uh, normally that would be the situation, uh, more of a classroom type of use, um, I, I think you can download it from the same site where the tutorial is. So any, anything that you see here in these NASA examples um, is, uh, is available for you to, to play with. Okay, so we have this uh, NAVSAC problem and um, and one of the things that I, that I should mention here about the order of these variables is that the, the variables are ordered in such a way that the, 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 smaller, the smallest index is the variable that has the largest so-called bang for buck, right? So, which is the ratio of the profit and the weight. So, the more profit and the less weight, the better or the more attractive the variable is. So, so this one has the largest ratio and X8 has the smallest ratio. It's ordered that way because in part for that um, spreadsheet I was telling you about, so, so when, when, when you do it in an interactive way, um, you don't have to worry about uh, finding those 
ratios at the time because we already know uh, the order of the variables. Okay, so this, for example, you say, well, okay, I want to solve this and I want to create a taboo search for that. And um, all right, so we need to design it. And this is a little busy, especially if you're all the way in the back. But I don't know how you can see all this, but I, I'll try to um, explain to, uh, what we have done here. So if we want to design a taboo search, and these four things will actually give you a search. That's it. You wouldn't need anything else. Um, we'll see that we can add to it, but this will be the very uh, core basic design that you could, uh, that, that, that one of them, not, I'm not saying the only one, but one of them. All right, so the first thing we need to de decide is, is, uh, is what a move is. So what we're gonna do here is, as you can see, we're going to move uh, in a way that it will, we, we are trying to find the smallest non-taboo active J, so that's the index of the variable, uh, that is zero, and you want to set it to one. So if you think about this, it's like we're gonna start here, and we're gonna start looking for something that is zero until we find it, and then we try to set it to one. Now, if, 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 uh, if as long as it's not taboo, all right? Now, if uh, the other piece is that it has, it has to be non-taboo active, but also uh, if you set it to one, you don't want to violate this uh, capacity constraint, all right? So we're gonna be sweeping, right? We sweep this way for, for adding variables. Now, if we don't find anything like that, right? it, could, it could be that we just don't find that, then we, we say, okay, well, if, that, if we couldn't do that, now we're gonna start searching from the other side, right? We're gonna start searching from here and start moving this way and, and trying to find uh, variables that are set to one and we want to set them to zero, okay? So it's, it's kind of a greedy way of searching, right? We want to add the variables that have the largest ratio and if we can add any variables, then we'll subtract variables that had the smallest ratio. So that's how we're trying to do this. And in that way, um, <coughs> you know, we don't have to search everything. The minute we find one of those things, we just flip it and then we move on, okay? All right, so what is the taboo attribute? The taboo attribute is going to be, in this case, just the index of the variable. So we're gonna keep track of uh, which variables we, we've been changing and, uh, and then we are going to activate them as, as, as taboo when, uh, when, uh, when, we're, uh, when we're moving on in uh, future iterations, so some of the variables are not gonna be allowed to change values, essentially, okay? So for how long? Well, we're just gonna set a number of iterations. Um, in this case, for these problems, we're gonna look at taboo tenures of two and three because really don't, we don't need more than that. Um, and then the aspiration criterion is what we talked about earlier where we say, hey, if we find something better that we haven't seen before, we're gonna take it. All right, so let's look at this table here. Uh, this table is uh, an initial solution and um, everything is, you know, uh, is set up for a reason here to be able to find certain features and explain certain things. So there is no real magic as to how this was found, but uh, is, is, uh, uh, all I want to show here is that the variables indeed are order in the ratio of bank for buck, right? And then um, we have a feasible solution where we have uh, right now variable one, four, five, and six, and eight, uh, with a profit of 33 and a weight of 35. All right, so let's look at this neighborhood. Now, again, I'm putting the entire neighborhood here, but uh, in reality, that's, if we follow what we say we were gonna do, you don't need to have it all explicitly there because we will just start from the top. In fact, the way the search will operate will start over here. Remember, this one is one, right? So X1 is one. So we'll go here and say, hey, um, do, do um, so, okay. This one is one, so that one we, we're not gonna touch. So the first one that we, we will encounter, moving from the top down, the first one that we'll encounter that is zero and that we're trying to set up to one, it will be variable two, okay? So that's that one here. So it's the first one we'll try here is to put that one in the knapsack and then we'll see that, yeah, the profit improves, of course, is 47, but then the weight is 47, so that's not feasible. So that will stop that process right there, okay? So the first one we will touch, the second one we'll try to put it into uh, one, 
and it didn't work. Okay, so now we're gonna have to start from the, from the bottom up. Now in the bottom, you see that x8 is one, and that one we can set to zero. So that one is, is, uh, is in red because in this case, that will be the move that we'll have to make. It will be uh, setting x8 to zero. Uh, and then we'll have only uh, as ones, one, four, five, and six, uh, profit is 30, weight is 30, and it's feasible. All right, so if we keep doing that, uh, here it shows 15 moves of this, uh, of this process. All right, the first one, this is our current solution, the, the one I show you. The, uh, in fact, that one <coughs> is iteration one because this is the current solution and the, and the move is eight, we saw that. So the move is eight. Uh, here the moves are just shown as the variable that changes values, so it's eight. And uh, so eight was set to zero. Um, this is the, the move that I just showed you. And then in the next iteration is three. So now we can add three, okay? Because now we're moving from, uh, from the lower index to the higher indexes. So, and then we can have a profit of 39 and a weight of 38 and so on and so forth. Okay, now what I want to show to you here that I want you to pay very close attention to that is the following. Is here are the, two, the taboo active elements, all right? So they stay only two iterations as taboo active. You see, we made the move in iteration one. So eight is gonna be active in iteration two and three, and then it leaves the taboo active list. Okay, because it leaves, then it can come back in <laughs> right in iteration four, all right? So you see, the reason we can um, add eight to the, uh, to the knapsack is that it, uh, it changed uh, its uh, status in this iteration and then in five we can do it again. All right, so th these are all the moves. Now I want you to pay attention to the following here. Uh, we look at iteration four, the solution is one, three, four, five. And in iteration 10, we're again at the same solution, one, three, four, five. Now, one of the things that uh, with taboo search is that you're trying to avoid is the so-called cycling. Cycling is when you keep going to the same solutions over and over again. Now, it could be that we say, well, this already cycle because it went from one, three, four, five, it went back to the same solution. But it turns out that it's not cycle yet. Uh, it will cycle eventually, but uh, with, this, uh, with this very small taboo tenure. But it's not cycle yet because I want you to notice the following. It's the same solution but look at the taboo active elements. It's six and three for four, and in 10, it's six and five, okay? So the, even though we ended up in the same solution, the situation is not the same, okay? Uh, it, the, in fact, the move, I believe, uh, let's see, the move is the same, but uh, the move that, that, that is taken is exactly the same, but you can actually for sure tell that this is cycle yet. However, later on in this search, now you can look at one, three, four, eight for iteration six, and then one, three, four, eight and iteration 12. And in that one, the conditions are exactly the same, right? You have uh, the same solution and the same elements in the taboo active list. When you encounter that, and there is no randomness in this search. There is nothing random in this, uh, uh, nothing probabilistic, nothing that will bring anything um, th th that will change the decisions. Then in that one uh, particular instance, then you can say that this search has cycle, okay? And in fact, I have a, a graph that you can see how this thing is just, it, truly you can just see the up and ups and downs and it's exactly, um, it gets repeating, uh, forever. Now, the way to break cycles, there are a number of ways of breaking cycles in taboo search, but uh, the typical way is, is modifying the taboo tenure. In this case, for example, only, you only need to add one more uh, iteration for the taboo tenure. So instead of two, now we have three, and that breaks the cycle. We, we can check all these numbers, but you will see that, that, that breaks the cycle. And not only breaks the cycle, but in this case, it actually uh, takes you to a better solution that we have found before. Right now we have a 39 and this one is 41, all right? So um, other ways that breaks uh, cycles is long-term memory. We're gonna see that, uh, but, but modifying the taboo tenure 
is, uh, is the typical way. Now, this is why in many designs, instead of having a taboo tenure that is fixed to a number, um, you will see in, in many papers nowadays that they say, okay, the taboo tenure is going to be a value between this minimum value and this maximum value, and we're going to draw that number randomly. So you can see that that will, uh, um, uh, even if you enter into some kind of cycle, that will break those cycles uh, almost immediately. Now, the, the, the minute you bring something random in there, all right, like even just that one thing, uh, uh, picking between two numbers what the ta taboo tenure is going to be, then you are, you are now going to this other world, <laughs> right, where uh, to uh, look at performance, now you're going to have to look at a statistical uh, performance of that method because uh, it's not going to behave the same way all the time, obviously, because of that random element. But that's a very typical um, way of, uh, of, uh, of breaking cycles and also of implementing the taboo tenure uh, process. Uh, I should say that, the, that if, if, if it's caref carefully done, this um, minimum, uh, this range of taboo tenure could be found experimentally. And uh, you find a range that is effective and you say, what I don't know is exactly which number to pick, and then I'm just going to pick it uh, probabilistically. But at least the range could be found in a, an experimental way that is not just an arbitrary number, okay? All right, so, and this is how it looks, right? So the taboo tenure with two is the blue line, and, uh, and we can see here about this piece here is when it starts cycling. Now, if taboo tenure of three, one of the things that you can see that happens is look at the swings here on the objective, because this is object the objective function value. Look at how much more noise uh, uh, creates, just even just putting one more iteration in the taboo tenure. It's typical because you know now you don't have the uh, smaller moves that will allow you just to be close to some kind of value for profit, and the, the swings are much uh, bigger. In fact, you can then put four here and you will see that this thing is gonna oscillate even more, okay? So there is a, a fine uh, a line there between, um, uh, between trying to break cycles and, and then making the search a little too cha chaotic in the sense of, uh, of, of big changes from, iteration from one iteration to the other. Now, of course, you don't mind the changes on top. Here is the 41, but then, then there will also be changes that, uh, that make, uh, make you spend a lot of time in solutions that are inferior. All right, um, let's move, move on here. Um, so let me just, give, uh, I'm gonna bring another uh, problem here, the linear ordering problem. Linear ordering problem, <coughs> for those of you who are not familiar with it, is um, you have a matrix of weights, and all you're trying to do is to order the columns and the rows is, is going to be the same order of the columns and the rows, in such a way that the sum of the upper diagonal of the weights is, uh, gets maximized. You know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a typical thing in uh, input-output matrices of, of, you know, sources and uses of, uh, of resources, but, uh, but that's essentially the problem, okay? And uh, the reason I, uh, I, I want to show this to you is that one of the, um, secrets, I guess, or <laughs> maybe it's not much of a secret, but it's, it's, it's one of the key things to do in, uh, in these searches, and this probably applies to taboo search or any neighborhood search, is to make moves and ca th those calculations as fast as possible, okay? Uh, I told you that you can see uh, sometimes that the design itself maybe of the search is maybe not that clever, but they have really clever ways of calculating moves. So they can make tons of moves and, uh, and in very short periods of time. And that uh, is very effective, of course, you know, even if the design is, you know, okay. So, so think about this one, for example. Uh, while we could say, okay, so the, the, the moves here are permutations. So, so you have a permit, so this is a, one of these weight matrices and, uh, and we have, uh, is the permutation one, one to seven, one to seven. And what we're trying to do is to take six, so six, and move it to position two. So we're gonna take six, put it here, and everything it shifts. And you say, okay, how are you gonna calculate the move value? Well, while you could certainly um, make the move, 
calculate the objective function value and then uh, subtract it from the uh, current objective function value, that's a lot of work and it's not needed. It turns out that for this particular example, and, and that's where uh, the studying of the actual structure of the problem pays off, is for this particular example, you see that, uh, or for this problem, you see that the only thing you need to do to get the move value is you, um, you add all these numbers and you subtract them. So you essentially element by element, you take this element and you take uh, and subtract it from, so, so you subtract this one from here and that one from here. So it's one minus four, six minus zero, two minus, uh, what is that, uh, six, and uh, 13 minus four. And that uh, actually calculates the move value. And there is no, so it's a linear calculation of the value um, as opposed, uh, and it's a fix, is fixed by the uh, distance between the position where it is and the position that it's gonna go and, and the number of elements that are in between. And, and that's all you need to do. So like that, uh, it, there are many problems where this is possible. And, uh, and that's definitely worth spending time trying to find uh, shortcuts for more values, okay? So that's what I wanted to show to you. It doesn't have really anything to do exactly with taboo search, but, it's, uh, but it does have to do with network search. Now, let's go back to taboo stuff. Um, now think about this. If the taboo classifications may prevent certain things, but actually may not prevent some other things. For example, let's suppose that you say for this problem, you have this permutation, one to seven, right? And you say, look, the, the index of the element that moves is going to become taboo active. In this case, element six moves to position two. I'm gonna say that that's taboo active and I'm, you know, the new permutation is that one. It went from that to this one. And I say, okay, six is taboo active and I'm not going, to, because it's taboo active, I'm not going to allow it to participate in insertions, all right? So I'm not going to allow it to move anywhere else. But it could move anyway, you see? Because the other ones are not taboo. And I could take, for example, four, right? And insert it here, again, in position two, because that's, that move is not taboo. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna move six, uh, one position to the right, to the third position. So things that are taboo, unless you basically absolutely fix them, and you say, well, we really need to just fix this thing, then the taboo classification has to be different. But if you're just saying, look, what I'm preventing is the, the same move from, uh, from happening again, so I'm preventing this from moving uh, on purpose, but it could also move as a result of other moves. All right? so, so things to keep in mind is that there, if, if you look at a neighborhood, uh, you probably, um, are preventing some percentage of the moves that are available, but, but in time, certain elements are going to move anyway, or they could possibly move. So things to keep in mind when, it is, when, uh, when you're designing something like this. All right, so all that was short-term memory, okay? All that is just to create a, what will be a basic procedure in taboo search. Um, now, if you want something more uh, elaborate, uh, we come to this, uh, um, uh, to this additional memory structure that is called long-term memory. The typical way of implementing long-term memory is by frequency. Uh, the idea is to take a look at things that have happened repeatedly in the past, okay? And two ways of, um, of doing that. Number one is, at least two ways, maybe more. But number one is to look at transitions. How we made this move very often. And if we have, then we don't want to repeat it again. Uh, has this element been part of a solution uh, for a long part or uh, uh, an extended part of the search? And if that happens, you might want to uh, not, not have that element in the solution anymore. Why is that? Well, because every single search is a combination of intensification and diversification. Long-term memory typically is there for diversification purposes, not only, but typically, okay? So how would you do that? Well, this will be one way of, um, of implementing 
long-term memory for diversification purposes. So think about this. You have an original move that has a move value V. Uh, we're going to create a penalized move value V prime with a penalty factor that, again, look, talking about adding complexity, now you say, well, what is this? What is what value is this going to be? So, well, and that's that's again another parameter in the search. Is how aggressive do you want to be with that weight value? Now, the one thing that I can tell you that uh, over and over the, using this type of a structure is that if you have an improving move, the best thing to do is just leave it alone. You know, if it's improving move, don't penalize it, don't do anything, just take it because that's the most aggressive way of uh, keep marching through uh, better uh, through the uh, search space to better solutions. Now, if it's not improving, you know, we're talking about a minimization problem here, as we said at the beginning. If it's not improving, then might as well penalize it. And in, you penalize it in a way that you say, look, what, if I'm not going to improve, I'd rather just go to something that I have not seen before, okay, than just keep doing the same thing. So that's, that's the basically the basic concept and thought about this, all right? Um, Okay, so, so let's see what happens in, the, in our little uh, knapsack example. Uh, what happens here in our knapsack uh, problem is that if we put uh, long-term memory in there, uh, notice that in the first few iterations, everything is uh, orange here because orange and blue, uh, in fact, are overlapping all the, all the way here, and here things start deviating, okay? Now, again, LTM stands for uh, long-term memory. You see what, what it does. It, again, also creates a wider range of solutions that are being, uh, that are being explored. So, and the more, uh, the more you penalize uh, values, the more you're going to see that behavior. Okay? So now there are two things that are creating diversification here. Longer taboo tenure values and putting a long-term memory in there that penalizes um, uh, non-improving moves. So those two uh, create those swings um, that you that you're observing there. Okay. All right. So um, that's another element. Uh, I will say very typical. The other thing that is being used for here we're using it during the search. Okay. So we're using it as we're moving along. The other way of uh, of using long-term memory is to restart procedures. So very typical way of doing this is that you go on, it started from an initial solution, you go on on a taboo search until there is some termination criterion that is satisfied and it says now we're going to restart the search. And when you restart the search, it could be restarted taking into consideration where that search has been in the past and that will be using frequency information to restart um, uh, into, uh, to create a new initial solution that is uh, diverse. All right, so we're getting, moving down the list of, uh, of the different elements of taboo search. Uh, we have now strategic oscillation. Now, this really um, comes from the very, very beginnings of, uh, of, ta of taboo search. In fact, uh, there they, they is a paper, uh, they, uh, of, uh, I think it's the 1977 uh, paper that, uh, that I had this um, idea in there that Fred wrote, uh, Fred Glover wrote um, uh, at that time, and it was along with these other elements. So this is not nothing that is new, but, it, it, but somehow it has not been made it, or has not made it into the mainstream of these uh, implementations for, for whatever reason. But you, you see how, how powerful it could be, uh, especially in, in this example. So the idea is that you let, um, you have a boundary, an oscillation boundary, where you, where you want to have moves moving on one side of that boundary and the other, okay? The typical example for this boundary in constraint optimization is the feasibility boundary. So in constraint optimization, you will say, all right, we've been working now uh, and, and showing examples where every time we were getting to that boundary where you, know, the, you have the um, total weight for the knapsack, we'll just turn around, you know, you, we don't want to cross it, you know, we uh, want to stay feasible all the time. Well, it may or may not be the best thing to do, you know, and in particular, in, in knapsack problems, 
the most interesting solutions are exactly where that boundary is, right? Because you will imagine that if you have still more room in the knapsack, you don't want to leave it empty. So it's going to be right there. So you want to be as close as possible to that boundary. Um, and why then, instead of always approaching the boundary from the physical side, why don't we allow ourselves to also approach it from the invisible side? That that's kind of the uh, rationale for this. Um, and in fact, I see Gary Kochenberger there, who has a multi knapsack uh, procedure that does exactly that, if I remember correctly. So, but this is this is the idea. So let's take a look at how we will do this here. Now, it brings some complexity because look, um, if we are going to allow this, right, to to uh, um, move away from feasibility, then the question uh, is how far, right? How far? How many moves are you going to allow to keep being invisible until you force it to come back and start being feasible? And that's again, you know, now you you say, all right. So if we, if I put uh, short-term memory, I had to decide on the on the taboo tenure. If I put long-term memory, I had to decide on that weight value at least. There are other things to decide, but at the very least. And if I put this in, this in there, I have to decide how far I'm going to allow it to move from the feasible boundary until it returns. OK, so just uh, with the, keeping with the theme on you know, uh, parameters and, uh, and complexity. All right, so let's see what we're going to do here. Let's say when approaching the feasibility boundary from the feasible region, we're going to select the best non-taboo feasible move, OK, the best. In this case, Forget about the indices and whatever. The, the best we can do, we're going to just do that, OK? Uh, anything that will, um, uh, that will keep it feasible. Now, if no feasible move is available, then we're going to select uh, the non-taboo move that improves the profit the most. So simply, um, we are, uh, we're looking at, hey, if we can stay feasible by adding a variable, uh, by setting a variable to 1, then let's do that, because that's the best thing, because you'll find a better feasible solution. But if we can do that, then just maximize the profit, even if it takes you out to the, to the other side, all right? So this is, a, this is one, uh, one rule that, uh, that we are putting new. It's a new rule, right? OK. Then in the infeasible side, so we want now infeasible. What we're going to do is we're not going to allow it to keep wandering in the infeasible world. Uh, we're going to say, all right, now you need to come back to feasibility. But what we're going to do is we're going to, the only way to come back to feasibility is removing variables, right? So removing items from the knapsack. So but we're gonna, gonna remove it the way we were removing earlier, which was with the smallest bang for buck ratio. So starting from the right side of that knapsack and, and just removing uh, variables that way. Okay, so if you do that, this is what you create, okay? So I, again, uh, I was talking about this spreadsheet uh, uh, Excel files that I have that, 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 that if you want to, because in here when we actually do these things, so we put a rule and we actually go through all the moves to, uh, you know, it takes a while, you know, you need like two hours to do these things. But, uh, but, uh, but if you want them, I think uh, it illustrates this, this process and then it creates these, these, these graphs, right? And, um, and you, can, you can see in this one, instead of, um, instead of profit here, we have weight, okay? So this, line there, the dotted line, is the 38, which is the uh, size of the knapsack, right? So this yellow one is the one, I believe the one, just the plain one, uh, without, uh, it's, it's a, yeah, this yellow or orange one is the one with taboo search of three, uh, the taboo tenure of three, and, um, and just always feasible. You see, every time it hits the boundary, it comes back. Now, the blue one is the one that oscillates in the boundary, okay? Now, uh, it's not shown here, but it actually finds a better solution that way. But it's always hogging that line, which makes a lot of sense because as, as we were pointing out earlier, um, uh, all the interesting solutions are there, right? There is really nothing that's too interesting down here. Obviously, the other ones over here are invisible, so you might as well stay in that boundary, okay? And, uh, and that's true for, for other problems. For example, um, we have another not as an example, but actually an actual paper where we're solving this problem that had to do with um, number of edges on a, on a graph, similar to the one I presented at the beginning, but not quite the same. But, um, but the idea was 
that uh, the way it, beco it becomes invisible is by allowing even more edges to be there or fewer, okay? And if you always try to keep it to being exactly the number that you need, then you're limited in the moves that you can make because you only can do swaps, right? One thing comes in and one thing goes out. One thing <laughs> comes in. And so if you want something different, like putting more things in, then you are creating an invisibility that either has too many elements in there or, uh, or too few. So, but that gives you an additional way of searching that you wouldn't have if you always try to keep feasible, okay? So it's a very um, common thing on constraint optimization to just um, stay, uh, allow the search to, um, uh, to, uh, to wander on the infeasibility side. All right, so all right, that, that, this is the last element that we're gonna cover in terms of path relinking before we jump into some of the concepts in, um, in scatter search, all right? And we'll leave some, uh, some time for questioning, for questions for sure. All right, so path relinking. Um, here, the idea is to, uh, if you think about everything that we've done so far, um, uh, the search is only directed by the, by the values of the move. So the objective function is the only thing that tells you where to go, all right? And in some cases, that may not be uh, the best. Uh, specifically, think about a problem for example, a um, mi uh, minimax problem, okay? In those problems where you're trying to find, um, uh, to, you're trying to minimize, say, the maximum value of something, uh, typically, in, uh, in a lot of those problems, uh, there are a lot of moves that are zero, okay? Because the maximum value is determined by some element that's in, in there, and you have to take a lot of things out before the objective function changes. So you have so-called these flat kind of surfaces of, uh, of the objective function where things just don't change with the moves that you have. So for that, and for other reasons, uh, path relinking could be very helpful, okay? In this, the idea is the following. Let's suppose that you know, um, you, ha you're, you have a current solution and you know of a solution that is, uh, that it has some features there that, that, that are attractive. In, in general, it could be that it's a good solution. And they say, okay, well, um, and you found these solutions during the search. So the idea is now that um, to uh, go from one solution to another, but not necessarily following the same rules that you've been following during the normal operation of the search, okay? In this case, the rules are going to be that you are only gonna look for the best move to make, but it's going to be constrained um, in a way that we only look at changes on the current solution that is going to approach the current solution to the guidance solution, okay? So we're moving towards that, there is a target, and in fact, when you get to that target, then the whole path relinking is, is, is over, okay? Um, so why do you wanna do this? Well, um, because when you found these two solutions, we were following all the rules, and we didn't explore certain things that we could have explored, um, but we didn't because we were only concerned about the objective function value. In this case, the objective function value is, um, is there, we evaluate it, but we only within the uh, confines of uh, what is possible the, in terms of uh, approaching the current solution to the guiding place. All right, so um, in essence, that's what I was uh, just, I was ahead of uh, myself here, but at each step, you make the best move that's part of the set of restricted uh, moves that, um, uh, that will, that will uh, approach this, the current solution to the guidance solution. So let's look at an example here. All right, so let's suppose that this is the initiating solution. I have two examples, one is the knapsack and then another one that is on a permutation. But so for the knapsack, so we have an initiating solution. So we have, uh, so we have x1 is one, x2 is one, four, x4 and x8. All right, now we're gonna, we're trying to move from here to this other one, okay? Now the moves here are gonna be swaps, all right? So the moves are gonna be swaps. So it's a, the only moves that are uh, allowed are swaps that are going to move uh, us closer from here to there. So um, there are a number of them in, in this one, but the one that we're gonna make, then within those swaps, the one that we want to make is the one that is best, okay? So, if we're sitting here, the best swap is seven, eight. 
seven eight is you just take this value here let's see yeah so we go from well actually the first move that we're making is three four so three four so we swap the values of three and four and we move from this solution to this you see by making that swap we're actually now closer to the guiding solution so we're putting two elements in the exact same position that uh, that are in the guiding solution then the next swap is seven eight and uh, and that does the same thing it brings this one to here or you know flips this one to zero flips this one to one and that puts us uh, closer to the other solution and then the final the final swap is two five and by doing that we finally get to the guiding solution now by doing these three things you see the first time uh, we well in in all these cases we were improving the profit and actually making the solution better but that's not always the case uh, uh, in, in, in this very small example, that happened um, because we only have a few choices. But think about this other one. I mean, maybe this is a little bit more interesting. This is for a problem that is called uh, the profile minimization problem, okay? And, uh, and in that one, what you're trying to do is, um, is create um, a matrix, uh, reorder the rows and the columns of the matrix in such a way that the profile of the matrix, which is basically all the elements that are non-zero, in uh, are, are in a as, as, as narrow of a band on the diagonal of the main diagonal of the matrix. So that's the, that's the idea of that, of that problem. Okay, so look at what we're doing here. In this one, we have A, B, C, D, E, F, and these are the, the ordering of the, of the columns or rows is the same one. And this is the solution, the guiding solution we're moving to. So we're going from here to there and uh, the values we're trying to minimize okay so you can see here that d is already in the position that it needs to be so that has this darker color and uh and it stays there now we're going to be inserting uh columns so for example for this one we say we're going to move a to the position where a is in this guiding solution okay so we go a has to go on the position five and that's where it goes now B needs to be moved from where it is to the position where it's in the guiding solution. So the same thing. So we do all that and we have this neighborhood, all right? And this neighborhood is all determined by the positions and in the guiding solution. All right, now we look at the objective function values and we see that it's 10, 11, 12, 11, and nine. So the best one is nine. So we're gonna move over here. Once we move here, we do the same thing. We're, we're now, you see, we move here because we pick the best out of this restricted set of moves that had to do with moving from here to there. And same thing here, right? Um, now we make the moves that we need to make and then we go to the best that we can possibly do. And in this case, look, in this case, and this is one of the problems that I was telling you, there are moves where, um, where nothing happens in terms of the objective function value. You see, uh, this one is nine and it's stay at nine, uh, all right? And then, um, uh, and then in the very next move, we actually find something that is better than the initiating solution and the, and the final solution. So this eight, uh, we, were, we were able to find. Now, the, the interesting thing about this one is that these two solutions were found during the search, but this trajectory was not explored in that search. That's what makes the pathway linking interesting, is that you are finding, new tra you are finding ways of linking solutions that originally they were found through some kind of historical set of moves, but now we're making moves different because we're guided by a different principle here. The principle is let's move and approach a solution that uh, that we want to uh, th that we want to use as a guiding uh, guiding solution. So that's um, uh, path relinking, and and the interesting. Another, uh, um, some of you may be familiar with the uh, meta heuristic called GRASP, and, uh, and there's been a, quite a bit of work on using path relinking within GRASP, because GRASP is this idea of, uh, um, of continuously um, creating new solutions and just finding uh, local optima for that solution, so it's, uh, it's a multi-start process. And uh, they say, well, hey, why don't we take those two local optima the, uh, that we have found and then create a relinking process between those two. And uh, it's been done quite effectively 
uh, in, uh, in, in, in a number of, uh, of situations and papers. So uh, something that I, I will recommend to check out. All right, so the, the, the whole presentation was uh, on purpose more uh, uh, he heavily uh, towards, uh, uh, towards this, uh, taboo search, but, but, but we said the tutorial was for both. So we have a section here of scatter search that is a lot more reviews than it was the, the taboo search uh, part. Uh, and uh, so that was by design and we have uh, the time that we have left, we're gonna use it for that. Okay, so scatter search is, it has two differences. Uh, I, I will say two main differences with, with taboo search. The first one is that it's a population based procedure. That is, instead of just moving one solution from one to another, uh, we are carrying a population of solutions that are being transformed in some ways, okay? So it's more of a, in a, the evolutionary uh, process than, it, than taboo search. So that's, that's one major difference. The other major difference, I will say, is that it's a lot more structure than taboo search, okay? Uh, if you, if you uh, think about what we just went through, it, there were so many design choices in all the examples that we, <laughs> we looked at that it could be mind boggling just to think about how, how to implement one of those things. Um, with, this, with the scatter search is different because this one is a very structured uh, process in which you can, you, you, you can get something operating, okay? So there are four, there are five methods, okay? Diversification generation, improvement, uh, reference set update and uh, subset generation and um, and then solution combination. I'll I'll show you how they interact. They interact this way. I have also a, another graphical way of looking at this. But but if, if you like algorithmic <laughs> type of structure, this is the way that it works. You start with creating a diverse set of solutions in any way you want. I mean, if if it's like if we were talking about evolutionary methods, it could be even random if you want to. You improve these solutions with an improvement method typically a local search. Um, then from there, we don't carry, so if this is a large population of solution, the reference set is actually a pre-reduced set. Typically 10 solutions, okay? So it's a very reduced set of solutions. And, uh, and that's the one that does the, um, the, the working mechanism of this is actually working over that reference set, all right? Um, so, what, what we are trying to do is to update this reference set with new solutions. So a uh, subset of solutions is created. It could be a pair, all right? That pair is combined in some ways. We're gonna look at some examples. And then, um, and then the, the, the whatever came out of the combination method is improved. So you put it into some local search, all right? And then we say, hey, do we have anything new? Are there any new solutions that could replace some of the solutions in the reference set. If that's true, then we update the reference set, and then uh, and then we keep going. So this is this while loop uh, is, uh, is is going to go uh, on until there are no new no new reference solutions included in the reference set. If there are no new ones, then we say we're done with that, and then you have a choice either to rebuild it or actually in some cases some implementations end here. They actually just completely give up after that. Uh, but you can rebuild it uh, by putting new solutions in the reference set and then do this uh, again. And it could be done until some criteria that has to do with time or number of iterations uh, is, uh, will be satisfied. All right, so in the, in, for the diversification method, um, one of the uh, probably lessons you know, that, 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 that you learn after uh, implemented some of these things, is that semi-greedy constructions work really well. And this, I was mentioning GRASP. GRASP is an example of a semi-greedy method where uh, you have a greedy function, but, uh, but, but you put some um, probabilistic elements there to not always pick the same element um, all the time. And uh, in one study, uh, I forgot to put the reference here, but uh, in, in one study, we actually look at that, at that uh, one particular uh, case, which is uh, what works well, all right? And let me explain what we have here. Here we, stand, we have a standardized value where I think, uh, let me think, yeah, where 
we can measure diversity in the scale from zero to one, and we can measure quality also in a normalized zero to one scale. Okay, so if you have the best diverse set and the uh, will be one, and if you have the set with the, with the highest quality, it will be one. So nothing gets to two, but uh, this is the this is the scale on this side. Okay, now in here what we have is ten different methods. Okay, of generating the uh, the initial population. All right, and here then we measure diversity in the dotted line and um, quality in this blue line looks like, and uh, and this is the total. Okay, the quality plus diversity. So I say exactly what metrics we use is, is irrelevant, but it's, it's basically what they were no normalized between zero and one. Th what I want to show to you is here, these methods, D, G, it stands for diversification generation method nine and method eight, these two were almost entirely random, okay? Uh, so you can see the diversity value is almost one, or maybe exactly one, while the quality is almost zero. Okay, so it, these 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 methods are totally random. Well, the idea was to to measure that and then turn these solutions into the scatter search uh, framework to then run with them and see which methods actually uh, turn out to be the best. And the study, which uh, the rest of the paper uh, is about, is to actually show a statistical difference between any of these methods and this last one here, which we consider, these last two, which we consider very balanced methods that have uh, uh, high diversity uh, and high quality uh, for the best scores on that. And that um, uh, made the, the process uh, a lot more effective, okay? And, and you're gonna see, and, and I think it has to do, you can, you can see, you can guess why, you know? The reason being, is that if you're only going to operate with a very with say ten solutions that are going to come from this process, is the initial process is to generate all these solutions, to then pick ten of them and then run the method with it. it, it, it you, you have to be very careful as to what which ten you're picking, right? And they had to come from a very good population of solutions. They can't just be all random, all right? Um, because it, it's going to take a long time for the process then to find. Uh, good solutions if you start just totally random. So this um, is just a very different philosophy from uh, evolutionary methods where uh, the populations are very large and, and they can uh, go through many, many iterations to then evolve that population into something uh, that will include uh, some high quality solutions. So this def definitely scatter does not start at random for the most part. Uh, it has, it has uh, um, it operates much better when you do something like this. All right, so uh, the improvement method is depends on the context typically, and um, I, I'll, um, I'll make a comment on when, scatter, and this is where scatter search and taboo search um, typically intersect, okay? Uh, you can put as an improvement method a taboo search if, um, if, um, if that's part of the design. Okay, so reference set uh, update method uh, there is, we have written <laughs> quite a bit on this. Uh, I just um, want to mention that typically you try to, uh, there are two things that you worry about, is updating that set by quality, so put quality solutions in there, and then also keep some diversity in that set. So there are rules to include um, a combination of diverse and quality solutions in that reference set. And the idea is uh, is so that uh, the that loop that we were, uh, discussing in terms of uh, that while loop, it could have uh, new solutions uh, and it doesn't converge and, and it stop prematurely. All right, subset generation, in that other paper where I, uh, where I show you that graph, uh, we also did another study which was the idea of, hey, uh, if you run a procedure, a scatter search, just uh, looking at pairs and combining pairs, um, would that be enough or what does it buy you if you then do uh, subsets of three, subsets of four solutions, subsets of five? It increases the combinatorial aspect of it because you know, how are you gonna pick these subsets so it doesn't get out of hand? But um, the conclusion was the following. 
is, is if you're going to get 100% of performance, let's say, uh, in a scatter search, well, about 80% of the performance you get it by, uh, by combining pairs. Okay? So a pairwise combination of reference solutions gets you probably 80% of the way. Now, the rest of the stuff you can get better, but is, is, is I will say, somewhat marginally better. That's the way, that's the way we, at least uh, uh, in that study. Now, it could be that maybe it was biased in some ways, but uh, I believe that that is true. So, so pairwise combinations is probably enough to, uh, to run a scatter search and, and get some get very good results. Now, solution combination, this is a wide open thing, and in fact, uh, but it has to do with uh, with the problem that you're that you're uh, solving, but um, but generally speaking, um, one thing that you see in many of these implementations is that instead of just being one type of combination, you have a set of possible ways of combining things, and then uh, and 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 that um, plays a role throughout the entire search. So. So it's no one, so, and that's very typical in evolutionary methods as well. You know, you don't have just one way of combining. You have the so-called these um, um, crossover operators, for example, in uh, in generic algorithms. Typically, implementations that don't have just one; they, they have a many of them, and that's very similar here. Okay. Now, in the combination uh, piece, that's where pattern linking could could play a role. Okay, uh, and I'll have a slide that that will probably show that. Uh, this is. Um, this is a, a way of, of seeing the method just in a, in a graphical way. I'm just going to go very quickly through it. You, know, you have this bubble here that generates initial solutions. You have a population of solutions that is much larger than the reference solutions. So you're going to have to pick from here, right? And all the blue ones are solutions that are not improved yet. I'm sorry, they, they, they have been improved. And all the orange ones are solutions that were generated in some ways that still need to be uh, thrown into the, uh, this improvement method. You see, it's very um, direct in terms of saying, you apply local search whenever you can. Uh, and and that's, that's on purpose, of course. And, uh, and, and you can see that that is probably where the method spends most of its time. Because combining solutions is very quickly, but improvement methods, which appear here, here, and here, uh, is the same one. But every time you... Um, start that kind of search, uh, it, in terms of time, it will probably spend 80% of the time there, 20% in doing the rest, okay? Um, so the connections with taboo search uh, are the following. Uh, in, there could be more, but at least this, right? You could have a scatter search method that has, as an improvement, a short-term memory, taboo search. Uh, you could have a scatter search method where the combination is path relinking. You see, because with path relinking, uh, as you relink two solutions, you're gonna find intermediate solutions that are the new solutions that you can consider for the reference set. And then the diversification actually comes here. You can put it here, you can put a long-term memory in there to then create new solutions that, that you have not seen in the past. And by, by uh, accumulating in, uh, data in terms of frequency values in here and then use it there to restart the search. And, uh, and well, it's not a total restart, it's just to rebuild the reference set. So there are these things that make scatter search and taboo search being, um, uh, being um, very complementary of each other, okay? Uh, let me see. Well, I have I have another example of how uh, this works, but I, I think I'm just gonna, in the interest of having a little bit of time to answer a couple of questions, um, I'm gonna leave this alone. This is another study on multi-objective optimization where we actually um, combine taboo search and scatter search in in ways that uh, made it uh, quite effective, I think. So, but I'm gonna leave it there. I'm going to just uh, then uh, <coughs> close this with. Um, uh, the typical way, and I will say it's probably still a very effective way of uh, designing a taboo search, is by starting simple, just like we did in the tutorial, right? Start simple, start adding elements, and see how those elements change the design and, um, 
And now, I also got to say that because the simple designs tend to work well, a lot of the times people just stop there and then that's, that's all there is, right? You say, okay, well, this works, so it's okay. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, but I think uh, looking at the, these other elements uh, could be interesting. Uh, the scatter search, even though it has, you know, it's like, okay, these are only five methods, there are, within each of them, there are ideas that, uh, that could help um, uh, extend what it does. Um, the, the, you know, we have experimented the, the way the reference set is being updated. That's one idea. Uh, m more use of memory around it. You know, that's also uh, something that, uh, that we normally see. Um, uh, the, in this work that is more of a, in the practice side and not research side, in practice side, uh, with Optech, for example, we have uh, we have looked at uh, at having a what we're calling this factory of uh, combination methods, uh, where there are so many of them, and uh, and how how you combine them and how you decide what's being effective and what's not is also interesting, uh, especially because those are, these are general software that is trying to uh, solve problems where not all the variables are. There are highly mixed problems in terms of some variables are uh, binary, some are regular integer uh, variables, you can have continuous variables, you can have permutation type of variables. Um, you know, we, we have this also, uh, some that are like more of like a project selection type of variables. So anyway, uh, it creates a very, very uh, interesting search space that where some of these ex extensions could be, uh, could, could really make a difference. And then the last thing is uh, just to say that the, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, path relinking on its own right uh, could actually be a search, uh, you know, as long as you have two solutions that you find in any other way, like the people in Grasp have done, uh, you can find it in other ways, I suppose. Um, you could actually create a search method just by following this idea that you march from one to another. So. So I want to leave you with those thoughts, and again, uh, thank you for, for coming, and um, we have a little bit of time for, for, for questions if you want to um, stick around and ask. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so typically, the way you will get this guiding solution is that you're, you're searching and you have so-called elite solutions, solutions that are the best solutions that you have found during the search. And then you say, it will be probably a good idea to try to go back to them in a, in a, from a different angle, if you will, you know, in a different set, with a different set of moves, okay? Because you got to them somehow, right? And they say, well, maybe around them is this idea of the principle of, uh, uh, of you know, of optimality. Like, uh, is, is there something, uh, uh, are there other solutions that are uh, equally good there in that area? Like for example, if, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just because um, the idea was that uh, you didn't know that you had the 36. The 36 was found during the, during the relinking process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so the main difference between generic algorithms and scatter search is that uh, in generic algorithms, you will be actually working on a population like that big, you know, say 100 solutions there, and you're evolving that whole thing through a series of rules and, and, and strategies. So the diversification there comes from having many solutions around. Diversification here comes from being strategic about which solutions you're gonna pick. And, and, and separate, there is, there is an idea, I didn't talk about it, but there is an idea of distance here, okay? So when you pick these solutions, there has to be a metric that says, is this enough, uh, you know, separated enough from this other? So I wanna uh, keep it there. When you use one and the other, I told you one thing that, uh, that really shape 
this methodology for us is on simulation optimization. It, uh, we were looking at uh, not running as, as many evaluations as, as you normally do in something like genetic algorithms. I mean, you look at a uh, number of evaluations on those uh, processes and it's hundreds of thousands, uh, if not millions of evaluations. Now, they're really fast, right? So I think, I think that's very effective there. But if you're looking at uh, not having that uh, benefit of uh, evaluating the objective function as many times, I think uh, something like this is more effective. Now, and at the same time, I will say that we found this more effective that taboo search for simulation optimization because in there, you, you, tr you try to be very strategic about where you visit next and you're trying to pick a point in a neighborhood. Well, for simulation optimization, that's also po uh, difficult, right? You want to, um, uh, you know, be able to uh, cover more of the search space more rapidly because you're only going to have a few, uh, a few iterations uh, to deal with. So I think there are strategies. I don't think that, that in general you say, well, I mean, they all perform about the same. We, which is true for a lot of problems. I think it's true for a lot of problems. I mean, I, I get tons of papers <laughs> in the general heuristics. And, uh, and, but, but then there are certain problems where you say, you know, I, we can't search that way. It's just not possible, you know. Uh, and sometimes it has to do, often has to do with how uh, much work it is to evaluate the objective function. You had a question. Yeah. 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 A guidance solution. You you probably just uh, one of the one of the ideas that actually uh, this uh, uh, Mauricio Resende and others in Grasp have done is instead of having just one, they have a set of guiding solutions, and they say as long as I can move, as long as the move uh, approaches any of those solutions is good. Okay. So so it's not as restricted as what you saw here. Yes, I could see that this could be quite restrictive. This is just one solution. But, uh, but if you have a set of them, then they say, well, any attribute that goes, that gets added, that it belongs to that set, then it's good. And, uh, and that gives you uh, more choices. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And that's changing, right? So during the search, this set, or even just the, even if you just have one guiding solution, that thing keeps changing. Okay, but but is the I think the notion that I think that we want to remember is to say there is diversification intensification. This one is actually an intensification process because what it's saying is that I already w I know I was there before. All I want to do is go back to it, but hopefully in a, in a finding new solutions because it's coming from uh, a set of different moves. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that, that's the that's the one piece that I skipped. But uh, we used it here, multi objective, and and here the idea was that you have uh, solutions in the efficient frontier that you are approximating, and then you create combinations of those solutions. And and I don't have a slide on that, but one of the things that that in this problem, in this particular problem we were looking at, was that a lot of the because the, we were comparing against generic algorithms. What was happening is that you had these approximations where there were a lot of gaps. You know, they have all this. No, no, no. With with what was in the literature, is you could see the you can see the frontiers, and you have a few points here, then a whole gap here, and then a few points over here. So the idea is, like, oh, how can you fill this whole thing and have a, a have a better approximation? So that worked uh, extremely well. This idea. Well, at least the ones that were reported there, and it may have been. What is hard to say is that, that one method worked better than another. The implementation worked better than the other implementation. Uh, uh, it was a, a, it was a um, nonlinear uh, multi-objective optimization. Uh, no, just uh, nonlinear functions. Yeah, nonlinear objective functions. Yeah, uh, continuous. So because these 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 combinations are actually. Uh, uh, linear combinations of points, you know, that is trying to fill. But what, what, I, what, what I was get, trying to get to is that 
maybe you put those same philosophy inside of the other method and it just works, it works well. I mean, a, a lot what happens is that there are certain elements that if, if you put it in there, uh, we're gonna make it more effective. Uh, so I, I, I'm hesitant to say is, is actually the methodology, but how it was combined and the elements that you put in there <laughs> turn out to be better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.